Whether you call it Kveik, Kvik, or Kvike, there's no denying that this unique Norwegian yeast has had a remarkable impact on the brewing scene, and Imperial Yeast's A43 Loki is one of the best versions out there. With the ability to produce a clean beer when fermented as warm as 104 degrees Fahrenheit or 40 degrees Celsius, you heard that right. While also performing well at more standard ale temperatures, Imperial Yeast A43 Loki is as versatile as it gets, meaning you have zero excuses for failing to brew throughout the year. Learn more about A43 Loki at imperialyeast.com and grab a pouch for your next batch to see what all the fuss is about. Weissbier, which translates to white beer in German, is a highly refreshing style known just as much for its hazy appearance as it is for its unique fermentation character. While it's well understood that the banana and spice common in Weissbier stems largely from the type of yeast used to ferment it, it's been claimed that the pungency of those characteristics can be modulated by the amount of yeast pitched. This is the Brewlosophy Podcast. I'm your host, Marshall Schott. And on this episode, I'm joined by contributor Cade Job to discuss the impact yeast pitch rate has on Weissbier. Yeah, this one actually came up out of a uh, conversation I was having at one of the virtual homebrew club meetings during the pandemic. And they, uh, the, the person who we was talking to, was we were talking about yeast pitch rate um, and how that was uh, important to beer flavor. And they said, hey, why haven't y'all done that in a Weiss beer? Why haven't y'all done that in a beer that's got these like heavy estery and phenolic flavors? Why didn't you choose that one as your style for, for, uh, for, for that experiment? And so I said, hey, that's a great idea. <laughs> Maybe I should go and do this experiment. Experiment. So that's what I did. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, it's widely accepted by brewers that pitch, uh, pitching an adequate amount of yeast is one way to ensure a clean fermentation while reducing the risk of off flavors. However, what's considered uh, an off flavor in one style is actually expected in other styles, right? So a perfect example is vice beer. Uh, I remember first hearing about this idea of modulating the banana and spice notes in these types of beers by pitching varying amounts of yeast uh, years ago. It's a super interesting concept, in my opinion, uh, and one that I look forward into uh, digging into with you, Cade. Uh, if you like what we're up to and you want us to keep doing it, please consider becoming a patron of Brewlosophy over at patreon.com slash brewlosophy, where you make a small pledge and receive rewards like access to unpublished contributor recipes, unique discounts at yakimavalleyhops.com, and an invite to a monthly live Q&A session with somebody in the brewing world. This month, uh, the, that guest in November of 2021, that guest is Dr. Matt Winans, research and development scientist at Imperial Yeast. Uh, if the name sounds familiar, that may be because he was interviewed by Cade on episode six of the Brew Lab, uh, which if you haven't already, I highly recommend listening to. They focused primarily on novel hybrid yeast strains. Fascinating stuff. I know I'm really looking forward to this session myself, uh, and I think a lot of you might enjoy it as well. If you'd like to be a part of it, be sure to make your pledge at patreon.com slash brewlosophy by Friday, November 26th, 2021, as this event is scheduled for Saturday the 27th. All past sessions are stored on our private Facebook page, so patrons can go back and watch them whenever they like. Again, patreon.com slash brewlosophy. And if you wouldn't mind using the links found at brewlosophy.com support slash support when shopping online, we'd really appreciate that as well. With the holidays right around the corner, we know you're all going to be doing at least some of your shopping at places like Amazon, More Beer, Adventures in Home Brewing, and Great Fermentations. Give our links a click. Uh, it'll take you just a couple extra seconds and really does help us out a ton. Thank you to everyone who has already been doing that. Finally, uh, if you wouldn't mind letting us know what you think about this show by leaving a rating and review in Apple Podcasts, podcast or wherever it is you listen to podcasts. We'd really appreciate that as well. Uh, I, we're, we're almost at that 900 mark, uh, which means we're, we're approaching that 1000 mark, which I think would be really cool. So if you could help us get there again, we'd really appreciate that. Feedback is brought to you by Brewers Hardware, who offer brewers beautiful stainless gear from fittings, kettles, and fermenters to brew stands and incredibly well-built turnkey systems. Do yourself a favor and head over to brewershardware.com the next time you're in the market for brewing equipment. Uh, they're sure to have whatever it is you need, and be sure to mention Brewlosophy at checkout, and they'll send you a free little gift. Again, that's brewershardware.com. Listener Aaron Moyers had some feedback on our episode where we talked about carbonating with honey. Aaron says, I've been making beer, mead, wine, and cider for about four years now, and I love the show. Uh, one thing I wanted to clarify for those that don't know is the statement of honey being antimicrobial. I feel that many people take this to mean that the chemistry of honey actively destroys organisms. Though honey is slightly acidic on the pH scale, it is inhospitable for bacteria because of osmotic pressure. Uh, this is due to the high sugar and low water content. This effect can draw water out of the cells of organisms, but many will simply go dormant. This is especially true of spores. Uh, if there's a 
dormant bug inside. It can wake back up as soon as that honey is diluted in another liquid. That being said, I personally do not worry about pasteurizing honey when brewing, simply because when added to wort or must, brewing yeast will typically outcompete whatever few other organisms could be lying dormant. Even when adding post-ferment, generally the ethanol content of your brew is enough to inhibit things growing. Infections are still most likely to come from poor sanitation practice. Mm, yeah okay that makes sense osmotic pressure i was thinking more of like viscosity issues mm-hmm. right like the bug would just have trouble getting around inside there you know i mean because it's just so thick and so dense uh but yeah that makes a lot of sense if the water is being exhumed out of the cells <laughs> then it's not going to be very hospitable for bacteria and yeast and things like that to survive uh so cool i i you know i had heard that honey is antimicrobial i think you mentioned it marshall and we talked about it a little bit, but wow, that's actually cool to put the sort of the why uh, or the science behind it. Yeah, yeah, it's cool. In all the years I've been brewing, uh, I've I've made one batch of mead. Uh, it was uh, with honey that I sourced from a local beekeeper, and I did not pasteurize it. I just blended it with filtered water and fermented it with, don't kill me on this, Nottingham yeast. <laughs> My idea was to make a really sessionable carbonated mead, which I did, but the results were less than stellar. Either way, there were no indications at all that this mead was contaminated. It was just not very flavorful, almost like a semi-sweet sparkling water. Anyway, we really appreciate the feedback, Aaron. If you have show feedback, you could send it to feedback at brewlosophy.com or drop us a note on social media. If I were forced to list my top three favorite beer styles, they'd likely all be pale lagers and one would certainly be German pills. That crackery flavor with noble hops and that perfectly crisp finish is just so good to me. Well, listener Chris Haskins from Seattle, Washington brewed up his own version of this style. He calls CP4 Capital Pills and sent me a bottle to share with my friends. One minute beer review with Justin and Tim. This one's pretty, Justin. This is a nice Look looking beer, Tim. Not bad. I get the nice. You can see right through it. Yeah, it's it's clear, aromatic. It's got some nice, uh, nothing off putting, nothing danky. That's good. A little fruity. That's exactly what I was gonna say. Yeah, could be wrong. We'll, we'll leave that with that. But uh, yeah, this is. Uh, I like it. This is delicious. Crisp, very crisp. It's clean. Yeah. Yeah. yeah right. Dry. It's, it's good. Got some champagne I like this. notes. Dang. Yeah, I know. I'm, I'm bringing it. I'm bringing it. Jersey who? This is a good beer. This is a real good beer. Hmm. Yeah, you definitely get a little little malt, a little bread flavor. like More crackery than bread. It's like you got a mouthful of saltines and you're dry and you're trying to whistle. It ain't happening. It's good. But yeah, I don't know. If, I don't think it's a Pilsner. I, I don't know what it is. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to go on. I'm going to say it's a Pilsner. <laughs> yeah, it's like when you take a test, you're, you're, you're bound to be right a quarter of the time. It's good, though. Yeah, this is a really good drinkable beer. Whoever made this, uh, hats off to you. Apricotish, a little bit. I don't know. Yeah, some stone fruit. That's good. I, I I would have another glass. I'm going for I'm going for an eight. You're going for an eight? Yeah. Ooh-wee. I like it. I like it. You know, I'm gonna raise your eight to an eight point two three. Boom. This is solid. Holy moly, this beer was near perfect. Absolutely delicious in every way. In fact, I'm not even sure if there's anything that needed to be changed in it. If I were judging this beer in a competition, it'd be difficult for me not to have scored it a perfect 50. The color, the clarity, the aroma, the flavor. Like I said, everything about this beer was about as perfect as it gets. Better than some of my favorite commercial examples of German pills. Chris, I envy you. Excellent job on this beer, my man. Please send me more. <laughs> <laughs> and how about that? I, you know, I would love to see that. Uh, what, what was it? I think Justin said it was uh, not dank, uh, a, like like a mouthful <laughs> of crackers and slightly apricotty, <laughs> right? I would just love to see that as like here's here's the descriptor of this beer: not dank, mouthful of crackers, and yeah, slightly stone apricotty. Fruit. <laughs> yeah, Which I don't know. Fruit. I did not get stone fruit. I yeah. did get the crackery thing though, so I'll give him that. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, I'm, I just assumed hoppy, right? Like or some sort of hoppy flavor uh, of flavor there but wow but it sounds really good and uh uh pray, props to uh, justin for doing a great job of uh, of, of replacing jersey there <laughs> yeah 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 jersey who <laughs> yeah jersey who exactly <laughs> yeah hey chris seriously a killer job man and and I, i'm very fortunate because chris sent me a grip of different beers that he made and uh i, I i'm not going to talk to those yet but i'm telling you they they were all good uh if you'd like to have your beer or any other fermented beverage you feel like sending in reviewed by justin and tim you can email me marshall at brewlosophy.com and we will get you all set up. We'll be back with talk of yeast pitch rate when making vice beer right after these messages. Have you
you ever thought about adding a port to your kettle but held off because you didn't feel like drilling into your gear or sending it off to have someone else do it? From the makers of the world's fastest counterflow chiller, the Exchillerator, comes the Hangover. The easiest way to add extra ports to your kettle as well as countless other options. Mount a faucet to your keg for easy portable pouring. Set up the perfect whirlpool arm. Hold a heating element in place. All of this and so much more without permanently modifying your gear. Manufactured right here in the United States, The Hangover offers brewers too many convenient solutions to list here. So head over to Exchillerator.com today to see what The Hangover can do for you. There's no denying that stainless steel is the best material for brewing equipment, and Delta Brewing Systems offers some of the lowest prices on high-quality stainless gear, like the Firm Tank, which in addition to holding 8 gallons or 30 liters of work, comes with a domed lid to even further reduce the chances of a messy blow-off, plus it can hold up to 4 PSI of pressure for closed transfers. Delta Brewing Systems also has their own line of brew kettles as well as one of the lowest-priced all-in-one electric brewing systems out there, and their prices are shockingly low. If you're in the market for legit stainless gear that won't break the bank, do yourself a favor and head over to DeltaBrewingSystems.com today. Craftmaster Growlers takes traveling with and sharing beer to a new level. Made from heavy-duty stainless steel, Craftmaster Growlers are double-wall insulated and can keep beer cold for up to eight hours. Unlike typical growlers, Craftmaster Growlers come with a swiveling tap and fully integrated CO2 regulator cap, allowing beer to stay fresh for two weeks or more. The square design takes up less space and will fit in most refrigerator doors, and every Craftmaster Growler comes with a one-year warranty. There are 64 and 128-ounce versions available over at CraftmasterGrowlers.com. After a long brew day, the last thing I want to do is waste more time chilling wort. I've tried so many different options, and ultimately I settled on the super efficient immersion chillers made by Jaded Brewing. With the King Cobra and Hydra, I'm able to chill my entire batch of wort from boiling to just a few degrees above groundwater temperature in as little as six minutes. If an immersion chiller is right for your brewery, then do yourself a favor and check out all of the rad options Jaded Brewing has to offer at jadedbrewing.com. And be sure to let them know Brewlosophy sent you. Having grown up in the Pacific Northwest, I was quite familiar with the popular commercial Hefeweizens from the, the likes of Widmer Brothers and Pyramid Brewing. While hazy, they were quite clean and seemed more malt-focused to me. It wasn't until a trip I took to Germany in 2003 that I had my first real Weiss beer on the advice of my wife's uncle, who told me it was like nothing he'd ever drank before. Sitting in a tiny, beautiful wooden pub in Munich, I inhaled a pint and was taken back, aback by how unique the fruit and spice character was. Uh, these days, I don't really tend to drink too much Weiss beer, in part because I feel like I overdid it when I was in um, when I was in Munich uh, in 2003. But I certainly enjoy uh, the, you know having a pint every now and again. Now, before we get into yeast pitch rate specifically, let's talk about Weiss beer in general, um, you know, and some of the styles that it's closely related to. Yeah, sure. You know, and I mean, this is where we'll get into a little bit of a de of a debate here. The difference between Hefeweizen and White and and Weiss beer uh, is there a difference, <laughs> right? Um, and uh, actually, I guess I can go ahead and say too. I I, uh, I talked to a German colleague of mine who's actually a, um, an exchange student here at Oregon State, uh, you know, studying beer. Um, and I asked him, so what's the difference between Weiss beer and Hefeweizen? And he kind of looked at me and he was like, I don't know what you're talking about. And I was like, you know, there's like Weiss beer and then there's Hefeweizen. I said, like people call it these two different things and he was like I don't know in Bavaria you'll hear people say Weiss beer and most of Germany honestly says Weiss beer but he was like if you walk into a bar and order a Hefeweizen no one's going to look at you funny they're, they're just going to go okay here you go yeah <laughs> so so apparently there may not be much difference b between those except for the name right the name I think uh, in typical German fashion describes the, th the thing Weiss beer yeah. white beer beer <laughs> exactly exactly well and and i you know i i say vice uh that the w is a is more of a v sound only because right. uh my my brother-in-law is from germany and would would slap me if i said it <laughs> weiss beer uh but he but you know you, i it's weird because if you look at i'm going based off of the bjcp guidelines right and uh up until 2015 Hefeweizen is what we saw everywhere. And then in 2015, you, the only mention of Hefeweizen now is in styles that refer or like commercial examples that have the term Hefeweizen in the name. And, and they don't have, there's not a style for Hefeweizen. My understanding is that it's just a, it's just a name thing, but that Hefeweizen and Weissbeer are basically the same thing. Uh, Weissbeer is typically made with 50% wheat um, and, and Weiss, like you said, means white, whereas Hefe, H-E-F-E uh, -E, means yeast, indicating that the beer is unfinished 
filtered uh, and visin means wheat. So they, they, it, they're, the, they're different names, same thing as I think the way most people are referring to those. There are some, uh, you know, unique differences between vice beer slash Hefeweizen. We're going to go with vice beer for the show and styles like wit beer, which is a Belgian style beer that, that is kind of similar. Wit means white. So it's kind of the same idea as vice, but wit beer, I believe has to include or almost always does include a, a dose of orange, uh, orange peel and coriander. Right. Um, I, I don't know if you would call it a wit beer without that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That orange and coriander really sets that wit beer apart. I mean, it is also a different yeast strain that's usually brewed, but has very similar characteristics. I mean, I don't know that you would notice necessarily. Maybe that's an interesting experiment somebody could do is brew with a, a you know the Weinsteffen strain versus the uh, Belgian wit beer strain. Yeah, uh, you know, and see if they taste the same. But yeah, that orange and coriander, right? And that's historically, if you look back at Belgium um, and their approach to beers, Belgians were very laissez faire, where or laissez faire. <laughs> where they just put a lot of the stuff in beer and see if it tasted good. Germans were very much, no, beer is brewed one way or two ways, right? I mean, you have you have a, a typical lager and Weiss beer, yeah. and that's it. I mean, and the, those are the only beers that you have, and you only have Weiss beer because, the, you know, it's brewed with wheat in it. Um, otherwise, otherwise, I don't know that Weiss beer would exist in Germany. Uh, but, you know, wit beer, yeah, wit beer has that orange and coriander, and I think that's what's really cool about um, the, the differences in those styles is that is that approach, Belgian approach to, uh, you know, having orange and coriander. I mean, then of course, I guess if you look in Germany, I said there's really only Weiss beer and, uh, you know, uh, uh, lagers, but they do have a thing in Berlin called a Berliner Weiss, um, which is the, the Berliner white. Um, and that's really just a, a low ABV sour beer mm-hmm. uh, that has a large portion of wheat, usually unmalted wheat. Um, and like you said, so giving it sort of that unfiltered uh, character. And again, Berliner Weiss just meaning white, uh, but really being that that like sour style. But all of those beers, so the Hefeweizen, the Wit beer, uh, the the, uh, the Weiss beer and the Berliner Weiss all have that uh, like a strong aroma character that's contributed by the yeast, yeah. and that's really you know that that really is one of the defining characteristics of those beers. Like if you didn't have um, some of those characteristics that we'll get into here in a soon, I don't think you could call it a Weiss beer, Hefeweizen, or a Wit beer. I couldn't agree more, and and uh, I think the the uh, a good comparison would be to what is now, at least according to the BJCP, referred to as American wheat beer, which are those you know your Widmer Hefeweizen, your Pyramid Hefeweizen, which are super clean, tend to have a little bit more of that American hop character. I love the style. It's it's probably in that top ten of like if I had to pick ten styles to drink for the rest of my life, American Hefeweizen or American wheat beer would be on that list because it's just so clean and crisp, and it has none of the characteristic you know fermentation uh, uh, aromas and flavors that a vice beer does and and so it's it I do think it's kind of funny that uh, you know I, I don't know who started the trend I tend to think it was Widmer Brothers who started the whole American Hefeweizen thing um, but the fact that we took that term Hefeweizen it makes sense because again it's an unfiltered hazy beer that's made with wheat so hey call it a Hefeweizen if you want but it is definitely not a vice beer and so I just wanted to kind of distinguish all of those different styles uh, again our focus is on that that very characterful vice beer in this one. Let's get into the yeast that's used for it. We understand that, you know, vice beer in general is going to be made with about 50% wheat. I think most people probably supplement that with either pale malt or, or uh, Pilsner malt. Not many. I, I'm not one in the very few times that I've made traditional German or Bavarian vice beer. I don't use crystal malt or anything like that. I really want that, that just blank kind of weedy canvas uh, when it comes to the malt. Uh, but hops, you know, you're looking at noble hops for the most part if you're making one of these. Really where you're getting the character, that aroma, the flavors the, the, that, that this beer is known for is from the yeast. Yeah, and it's important to talk about that aroma and flavor, right? It's banana and clove. Uh, th- those are the things. Those are two key characteristics of a Weiss beer. Um, and I, in my opinion, if if you're trying to brew to style, um, you know that that's what you have to you have to hit those things. You got to have banana and clove. Now they, they they can be in different amounts. Like for example, the Weinsteffen strain, which I think is the, one of the most popular ones that 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 people brew. That's yeah. Stefan uh, from Imperial. That one's really heavily clove, right? But there is some banana in there, but it's really heavily clove. 
there are other strains that are out there uh, uh, for Weiss beer strains that may be heavier on the banana, but it's really those two things, banana and clove uh, or spicy, right? I mean, yeah. you can think about it however however you want. I think about it banana and clove, but those those flavors come from um, an ester and a phenol. The ester isoamyl acetate tastes like banana, and then the phenols four vinyl glycol, uh, which gives that clove uh, that clove flavor. And so those are those two things, those esters and phenols. The production of those is something that the yeast contributes to the beer. If you don't have that yeast strain in there, um, you know you may not get those two things uh, in the beer. And so that was sort of the impetus of looking at 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 this. Um, experiment is we wanted to look at pitch rate and how pitch rate influences uh you know the flavors that the yeast produce and it turns out there's actually some you know really interesting chemical pathways that these things have to go through in order to get ester and phenol production and there are a whole bunch of different things which we'll talk about with, that you can do to you know improve esters and or and phenol so to get more of that clove or banana character yeah you know and and there's um you, you, it's weird to say this i i I talk about my my thing with Cal Common, you know, all the time is like Cal Common has to be made with Northern Brewer, yada yada. You literally cannot make a vice beer with like the Chico strain. I mean, you could try to, uh, but it's not going to be a vice beer. You're not going to get that that isoamyl acetate, four VG ester phenol complex that you expect in a vice beer. I mean, that is what defines the style, in my opinion. Besides the fact that it's made with wheat. Um, now, would I'm not a microbiologist? I say that often because I don't want anybody to think I'm some expert here, but Am I correct in saying that the common vice beer strains that are out there, like you said, I believe it's GO3 Stefan from Imperial Yeast, that they are POF positive. They are phenolic off flavor positive. Yeah, definitely. And that, those are the ones that, that we sort of, if you look historically at why we call beer, some strains POF positive and POF negative, it was because there's a whole bunch of wild yeasts out there that create that uh, spicy clove uh, phenol character. There's a whole bunch of just wild yeasts that do that. But what distinguished brewer's yeast, quote unquote, historically was their ability not to produce that clove right. character. So you can imagine, right, if you've got an American light lager, like a Bud Light, Miller Light, Coors Light, something like that, and you a bunch of clove in there Ugh. that's going to really turn people off um and same thing with like a nice german pilsner or german hellas you don't want that clove flavor but in a uh in a a weiss beer that clove flavor is super important now that what what poff means is phenolic off flavor president right uh, but really what that means is the yeast has a specific enzyme that releases bound aromatic phenols so all beers will have these aromatic phenols that are bound together in them what certain yeasts uh, secrete an enzyme that breaks apart that bond and that's what releases that phenol and gives you that spicy clove flavor and if you, if you want more information about phenols um, go check out episode 30 of the brew lab where I talked to dr. Uh, Mike Lentz about it we just spent a whole hour talking about phenols <laughs> which is really cool so that's one part of this, right? That's one part of the Weiss beer is that phenol character the other parts that banana character and it turns out that that banana that that ester uh, isoamyl acetate comes from higher alcohols and certain yeasts during their growth phase they take up a whole bunch of amino acids those amino acids then become higher alcohols and higher alcohols turn into esters through a chemical pathway that i'm not going to bore anybody with <laughs> if you want to know shoot me an email and i'll tell you about it but is certain yeasts take up those amino acids and create higher alcohols in different capacities so that's why when you talk about like belgian strains you might say oh this belgian beer you know this triple that i had tasted fusily it had a high uh, like a, a high alcohol character to it certain strains do this differently than other beers so just like you've got a strain that secretes this enzyme that releases uh the clove character you've also got um strains that uh that that take up amino acids produce higher alcohols and then that turns into esters so that's how this yeast actually works right so this yeast uh, a, uh the the weinstefan strain is a great example stefan um th that has both of those yeah. components in it it takes up a lot of amino acids and it also gives off a lot of this um uh, uh you know bound uh phenols in the form of clove from a very very uh high up in the air perspective how freaking cool is that? I mean, there's this entire style that is driven by this very particular type of yeast that produces this blend. I call it a complex, you know, of, of ester and phenol character that when together is so 
uh, it's so distinguishable. It's so it's so its own thing, and I just think that's so rad. You know, one thing is now, uh, you know, we, we talk about modulating the ester and phenol. Uh, uh, I guess amounts that are in a beer. There are people who are going to prefer a more banana y vice beer. There are people who are going to prefer more spice, and then there are people like me who want it perfectly balanced, right? And there are a few different ways t- that that are talked about at the very least of uh, modulating that. I think one of them first if, is if you really want to get that spicy clove white peppery character is a ferulic acid rest. Uh, I'm going to let you kind of touch on this a bit, Cade, because I know you know about this stuff more than I do. But like like other steps, in the, if you're doing a step mash, the, the ferulic acid rest is one that is said to, if you do it, I guess, uh, accentuate what, in, during fermentation, you're going to get a stronger clove character. Yeah, so ferulic acid is the precursor, right? Ferul- right. At least this is my understanding. Fer- ferulic acid is the thing that gets that has that clove phenol attached to it, and certain certain yeast will uh, break that bond and release that clove phenol. So if you do a ferulic acid rest, you're increasing the amount of ferulic acid in solution. Now, if you're using a yeast that's not POF positive, that doesn't have that that gene that releases the enzyme, you can have as much ferulic acid as you want, and it's just a not flavor active compound. So to just sit there in your beer and it won't do anything. But yeah, that's a that's a really uh, common tool that people do to increase phenolic flavor, especially if you've got a POF positive yeast. Right. You mash at a lower temperature to increase ferulic acid, increasing the bound precursor, increases the amount of clove that's produced. Ostensibly. I mean, we've done it. We, you, if you, we, we will do a show on this. We've done the experiment on the ferulic acid rest. Uh, you can check that out for yourself if you'd like to. But just just so you know, this is a, a, a 15 minute rest, basically anywhere between 40 to 50 degrees Celsius or 104, 122 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, you hold it for 15 minutes and then it, and then it goes on to do exactly what Cade was saying. Another one, and I hear this one talked about quite a bit. Uh, another, I guess, factor that can that can modulate this phenol and ester development is fermentation temperature temperature and what what I what was drilled into me uh, you know it, it, what you know on forums and at homebrew club meetings is that if you want more spice ferment it cool and if you want more banana ferment it warm we under, we know that esters tend to be get developed in warmer environments we know that I don't understand the uh, theory behind uh, why a cooler environment would favor phenol production but that is what's talked about as one way again to modulate those those two characteristics. Yeah, and I, I have some theories about this one. I'm not exactly sure on the science yet, so so don't don't bash me too hard if I get the science <laughs> wrong on this one. But my understanding is is yeah, esters are produced at higher temperatures because it accelerates yeast growth. Um, and so again, as yeast is growing, it's taking in these amino acids to make proteins. Right? I mean, that's a, it's a basic building block of of structures in the yeast cell. Uh, so it's taking in all of these proteins, and if it's hot, it's taking in a lot of them because it's got to grow really fast. Mm-hmm. Um, so those proteins. Proteins, those are amino acids that then react to form high fusel alcohols that then react to form uh, esters later on down the line. So yeah, if it's higher temperature, then you have higher esters. That makes a lot of sense to me. The cooler one favoring phenol production, that's the one I'm not sure about. And that's because if you have a yeast that's POF positive, it will release bound phenol precursors. Right. So it doesn't matter what temperature it's at. So maybe if it's fermenting cooler, you're reducing the ester amount, so making those phenols pop a little bit more, right? So may- maybe that's part of it. But I don't know that fermentation temperature would have a lot to do with phenol production itself, if you yeah. were just sort of managing the compound. But either way, I mean, th- those, there's two ways, right? I mean, the, 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 it, it makes sense. Ferment warm and you get a higher ester production. Yeah, and so that, that part of it makes sense to me as well. That if So if you're going to suppress ester production then the phenol is going to be more noticeable so perhaps that's why it's it's more of just an ester issue and then and then the perceptible phenol is going to be stronger if there's less esters i don't know but the focus of this episode is on yeast pitrate which is yet the another way that they claim you can uh you know uh adjust you know your ester and phenol uh characteristics in a vice beer Let's let's go over the kind of the basics of pitch rate first off. We know, for example, that you want to pitch a proper amount of of yeast based on what what, what you're brewing, how what your OG is, whether it's an ale or a lager, stuff like that. 
Yeah, and so let's take a real simplistic view of this, like a high level, right? There, This is a closed system. So the nutrients in the system are limited. But what that means is, is that there's, there's yeast that are all competing for those nutrients. There's not new nutrients coming in, right? We're not putting new sugar into the fermentation to keep it going. There's a limited amount, and the yeast are all fighting for that, that nutrition. So if there's too much yeast in solution, there's not enough nutrients to go around, and you have yeast that's not as healthy, right? If there's not enough yeast, that means there's gluttony, right? The yeast get to grow. They get to eat as much as they want. They get fat um, um, and they can grow super fast and die and 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 produce all these other off flavor characteristics. Right. Um, so I think from a very high level perspective, yeast pitch rate makes a lot of sense because of competition for for nutrients. It's a very sort of simplistic view. If you want to dig under the hood just a little bit more, under pitching means that the yeast, there's not enough yeast in the fermenter er, to start off. So they get to just go wild and they, they grow and they just grow and grow and grow. And that growth, like I said earlier, results in the production of higher al- alcohols, which then results in esters. Okay. So if you under pitch yeast, yeast, there should be higher ester production. At least that's what sort of the science would dictate to us. It also means that the fermentation is going to be slower because yeast is spending all this time growing and not, um, uh, it grows first and then it will take in sugars and produce alcohol. Yeah. Yeah. That's so interesting to me too. And, and the, I like the way that you explained it cause I never really thought of it that way. The way that I always heard was that by under pitching, you're stressing the yeast. And when you stress yeast, they throw off more, what we would refer to as off flavors and clean beers. But in this case, it's it, their desirable characteristics, those esters and phenols. And it's that it's that quote unquote stress on the yeast that causes that to happen. Yeah, exactly. I mean, these yeast are growing, 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 and they get too fat. <laughs> I mean, it's like, I guess <laughs> I the way relate. of thinking about it, right? <laughs> yeah, and so they so that that causes them stress later, um, and they have to do something to get rid of those amino acids, and so that's where they do this thing where where they produce the higher alcohols that then get changed into into esters. I mean, over pitching also has problems too, right? I mean, one of the biggest things for over pitching is it's just kind of wasteful. <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, if you're putting in too much yeast, you don't need that much. Why are you spending the money on that yeast, or why are you putting it? in there. Uh, but the other thing too is it makes a fermentation really inefficient. If you've got too many yeast, too much biomass in there, that means yeast are having to compete too hard. They're not as healthy. They're not going to proceed through fermentation as efficiently or quickly. Um, they're not going to maybe not produce as consistent um, alcohol and CO2 as other yeast would. You know, So obviously those aren't as bad as like, hey, there's these terrible off flavors that come from it. Um, uh, you know, but, uh, but there are, you know, problems with over pitching and under pitching. And so that makes a lot of sense is why we wanted to approach this from a Weiss beer perspective. We have this yeast that its whole purpose or the whole, the whole style is dependent on production of esters and production of phenols. And so if those things are impacted by the amount of yeast that's pitched in solution, it stands, it stands to reason that we might see some sort of effect from under pitching or over pitching a white beer, right? Yeah, it, it makes sense to me that that would happen. And, you know, what I, the way I always think about uh, pitch rate in general is we've all had that experience. I, I, I made a Kolsch one time. Um, I, I'm sure I've told this story before, but I, I, I've had like a couple free out, you know, a couple free hours on a Saturday. The wife was out doing something. The kids were taking naps or whatever. So I decided I'm going to go whip together a brew in, brew in a bag. This is before brew in a bag was my, my main go to approach. Uh, just whipped together this Kolsch and pitched some leftover uh, deer that I had in the fridge that I had harvested from a starter like three or four months prior. Well, I did that. It was a significant under pitch. And that uh, like two days later it was when I started to notice fermentation activity, which by the way is way too long in my opinion, <laughs> two days to get any fermentation activity. And it smelled like burnt tires. Well, come to find out that burnt rubber characteristic is a phenol. Um, and, that, and that's what causes that. So it may, that was kind of like a, a, an experiential, you know, in vivo uh, uh, experience for me that proved under pitching really can produce uh you know this phenolic off flavor and even though that yeast isn't necessarily known for being pof positive i don't think you know the the pj for us strain um but i but i got this thing anyways like man you really got to pitch proper amounts because this was awful smell yeah and it's so interesting too right i mean i'm not a microbiologist either um maybe a microbiologist in training um really not even that more of like a chemist <laughs> but uh, but 
you know, when you look at everything that goes on in the yeast cell, there's hundreds of things yeah. that are going on all the time, right? And, and so you, you you just think it's all it's always so funny to me to think about too how we ended up selecting this yeast that has these specific characteristics, right? Because there's so many different things, and and you know what what luck that some brewer had to you know maybe did a ferulic acid rest one day and and didn't know that there was ferulic acid, but knew that whenever they did this thing where they mashed at a lower temperature, they got this clove flavor. Yeah. Uh, so it's really impressive to me to think about like, you know, you had that experience with phenols, right? Where you got this, uh, this burnt character out of your uh, burnt rubber flavor out of it. And because of that, you attach this and now, you know, okay, if I do this, if I under pitch my yeast, it results in this thing. And I just think about how like iterative that is and how we've, we've, as brewers and as brewing chemists and, and scientists, now we look back trying to explain why uh, <laughs> things are that way. And we may not ever have a clear picture, but it's really cool. And Weiss beer sort of is a really nice microcosm for what's going on inside the yeast cell and how that ultimately uh, uh, impacts beer. And pitch rate being a really big, uh, a bi- really important part of that, right? It, pitching a lower amount of yeast likely means you're going to have more uh, esters or what we might consider call, you know, fermentation character. Yeah, exactly. Well, I've never intentionally under or over pitched a vice beer in part because I don't really brew that much vice beer. So the, t- the times that I have made it, I just, I, I pitch what I would imagine is a proper amount, you know, uh, but I've certainly heard of this idea that yeast pitch rate impacts the ultimate character of this style of beer and wanting to see for yourself, Cade, you put it to the test results when we're back from this break. The brew in a bag method is blown up over the last few years, and in that time, it's become very clear that not all bags are created equal. For the best BIAB experience, you have got to go with the brew bag. Made from high quality, food safe polyester, the brew bag is available in both 210 micron for standard brew in a bag, as well as 400 micron, which works beautifully for all in one recirculating systems. I've been a brew bag user for years and wouldn't brew without it. Head over to brewinabag.com to get the fabric filter that works for you and use promo code TBP17 at checkout out to receive a discount. Again, that's brewinabag.com. Family-owned Atlantic Brew Supplies, the largest homebrew shop in the Southeast. No gimmicks, no multinational corporate overlords, and no BS. They offer exclusive malts, yeast, and more from local artisans, as well as award-winning recipe kits. They also sell professional brewing gear and cask equipment from sister companies ABS Commercial and Cask Supply. Most ingredients are available by the ounce, plus Atlantic Brew Supply has an on-site calculator to help you craft your best brew. Orders are processed same day, and two-day shipping is guaranteed for East Coast customers. Get 15% off your first order using promo code BrewPod. That's B R U P O D at AtlanticBrewSupply.com. As every brewer knows, the best beer requires the best hops, which Yakima Valley Hops provides fresh from the source to brewers around the world, carrying everything from classics like Cascade to modern favorites like Galaxy and Mosaic, as well as other ingredients and gear, Yakima Valley Hops has it all. And don't forget to check out their new podcast, The Late Edition, where the YVH crew goes into depth on our favorite plant with industry experts. Head over to YakimaValleyHops.com now to see all they have to offer and subscribe to The Late Edition wherever it is you listen to podcasts. Compact and simple to use with a small footprint for brewing indoors, the Grainfather makes it easy for you to brew professional quality beers at home. The Grainfather is an all-in-one brewing system that lets you brew all-grain beer in a single, compact stainless steel unit. It uses an electric heating element and pump to maintain a constant temperature and to circulate the wort during the mashing and cooling stages. It also comes with a counterflow chiller to reduce chilling times and produce high-quality wort. And now, with the addition of their conical fermenter, the Grainfather takes things one step further by offering homebrewers state-of-the-art temperature-controlled fermentation just like commercial breweries use. And with the Grainfather Recipe Creator and Connect app, you can easily design a recipe, sync your brewing system with your phone, and then just sit back and relax as the app takes over and assures that you maintain your scheduled mash temps and boil schedule. Head to GrainFather.com to purchase your all-in-one brewing system today and to sign up for their free recipe creator tool. Once more, head on over to GrainFather.com, that's GrainFather.com, and get started today.
For the most part, pitch rate is determined based on gravity of the wort and fermentation temperature. Higher OG worts and cooler fermentation temps require higher pitch rates, while lower OG worts and warmer fermentation temps require less yeast. Pretty simple. However, some contend that styles like Weissbeer benefit from pitch rates that fall outside of that normal range. Cade, uh, you were curious and performed an experiment to test it out. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I was interested in seeing what an underpitched versus an overpitched batch would uh, would do in a Weiss beer. So uh, I started with dual five gallon batches of Weiss beer in my uh, Brow Supply uh, 110 volt units. So the grist was pretty simple. Uh, 52% Pelton, uh, Mecca grade Pelton Pilsner style malt. And then it had 24% wheat malt and 24% flaked wheat. Uh, so about 52%, you know, barley and, and uh, 48% wheat. Pretty standard uh, Weiss beer recipe there. Uh, brewing process was also pretty standard. I mashed both batches in 149 Fahrenheit or 65 C for 60 minutes. Uh, and then after the mashes were complete, removed the grains and boiled for 60 minutes. Uh, both batches just got a single hop addition. That's pretty common also for Weiss beer. Uh, I just did 28 grams of Tetanang uh, at 60 minutes. No other hop additions or dry hop. Um, and then when the boils were complete, I uh, chilled out, chilled the wort, took refractometer readings to confirm that both had hit the same OG, which was 1046, which was exactly where I was hoping it would be. Uh, then I racked identical volumes of wort uh, to brew buckets. And then this is where the variable came in. So the recommended pitching rate when you're considering the total volume of beer being fermented, which is five and a half gallons or 21 liters, uh, and the fermentation temperature was 66 Fahrenheit or 19 C, uh, you'd need 190 billion cells. Now that's per the Brew United calculator. Uh, and I think I even also looked this up in Brew Fathers whenever I was doing the pitch rate, but you need around 200 billion cells for that volume and that temperature. That's the takeaway. Uh, so I started with two fresh pouches of uh, Imperial Yeast G01 Stefan, which is the Weinstefaner strain that we've been talking about. Uh, and they both allegedly have 200 billion uh, yeast cells uh, in each pouch. So using that as sort of my assumption, I didn't do any individual cell counts. So hopefully nobody faults me for not having a microscope. Um, but uh, essentially, then we can say that if I measured off a third of the combined yeast slurry and pitched that into one batch, while the other batch got two thirds of the slurry, that the breakdown would then be the under pitch batch gets 100 billion cells and the over pitch batch gets 300 billion cells. Does that make sense, Marshall? Yeah, to me it makes perfect sense and and to put it in context, you are you know, we are calculating based on again the the Brew Father and the Brew United calculator which I I believe use the same basic uh you know, algorithm or whatever, it, that you are uh this beer based again, five and a half gallons, 21 liters of uh of 1046 OG wort that's going to be fermented at 66 degrees Fahrenheit or 19 C. It needs 190 billion cells. Now, Underpitching uh, by by about 100 billion cells or 90 billion cells, that underpitch batch is only at 100 billion cells. The overpitch batch is at about 300 billion cells. I think this is very interesting, and I'm my per if if the whole pitch rate thing with vice beer is you know is true, I would expect the underpitch batch to have more fermentation character overall than that overpitch batch. Which uh, one of the things that's often talked about with overpitching in general is that it can produce um, a cleaner fermentation profile overall because that yeast is so you know you have so much of it that it's not really you know under stress as it were yeah exactly i mean this is a three to one i mean if you look at the ratio right uh, um there's three times as many yeast as much yeast in the over pitch versus the under pitch and so yeah i would think you know this is where you would see uh some of those things that we talked about in the first segment which is you'd expect to see higher estol esters and maybe some additional phenol production right yeah um and so hopefully uh, that's where we get now i think some people might complain that a hundred billion cells is plenty uh for for a weiss beer and fine right if that's your, if that's your experience Experience, that's great. This one, we wanted to make sure that we were starting with a calculator. So we had a way, you know, we were showing that this is actually calculated as an underpitched uh, yeast. Yeah. Uh, and so, all right. So fermentation and this thing is this where things kind of get interesting. So the overpitched beer was fermenting vigorously um, and it, uh, very quickly, like I would say within you know, probably eight to 12 hours. But the underpitch batch didn't start fermenting until 18 hours later. 
Yeah, that's fascinating. Uh, it's also totally expected. And I think anybody who's ever done a pitch rate experiment comparison has noticed this. And I, this has nothing to do with the vice beer uh, thing. If you pitch a lot of yeast, you're going to get fermentation quicker and more vigorously. That's just that's just a fact. Yeah, exactly. And it was cool that I got that I saw that too, right? I mean, these are these are things that are just facts, but you see these in the uh, uh, in the experiment. Well, you know, that also sort of made me made me curious, like, uh, you know, how is this going to impact fermentation, right? Are we still going to reach the same FG if, yeah. if one's taking longer? So after two weeks, uh, both beers looked like they were done fermenting. So I took hydrometer measurements and both had hit the same FG, which was 10.06. I, I think that's interesting. I know that there was, uh, oftentimes you'll hear people talk about stalled fermentation. You know, I, I feel like that doesn't come up nearly as much these days as it used to. Uh, maybe that's because we've got better yeast, uh, you know, access to better yeast. But people used to say, oh, pitch more yeast. Well, I don't know if that will be helpful. I, you know, yeast is going to ferment. To me, uh, I always think of pitch rate not so much as a um, fermentation performance uh, thing, but as a character driver. You know, in the beer, that, that under pitching could lead to more in cleaner styles, off flavors, or in vice beer. You know, ostensibly, it's going to lead to a stronger fermentation character, not so much a, a uh, attenuation issue. Yeah, you know, I would say I, I've heard of underpitching and overpitching leading to inconsistent results. Sure. Right. Yeah. I mean, and, and so that may be a thing. And so it was good that we hit something consistently here, right? That I got the same FG. Um, it would have been, I, I don't know how I would have explained it if it was a very different um, final gravity. Because, like you said, right, Marshall, I mean, uh, it, it should take it all the way to the final gravity, uh, depending on, you know, just based on what was the original, you know, content, the, the sugar content in the beer. Yeah. So that makes sense. And I'm glad that it did hit the same uh, final gravity. So once the beers were there, I cold crashed the beers to 32 degrees Fahrenheit or zero C overnight uh, before pressure transferring both beers to CO2 purged kegs and then burst carbonating. And then I let them sit a couple of weeks to condition uh, before evaluation. Now, this was done during uh, the pandemic where we weren't uh, serving beers to blind participants, which is unfortunate, but we had done multiple yeast pitch rate experiments before. Uh, so on this one, uh, suffice to say, it was a single participant who happened to be the brewer of the beer as well, <laughs> Cade. So why don't you tell us about how, uh, how you did on your uh, trials? Yeah, well, first, if you look at the beers, I mean, I think they looked exactly the same. I don't see any differences. If you look at the pictures on the website, they look, um, they they appeared uh, to be the same. But really, uh, what I would expect to be different is their aroma, um, especially, right? Sure. Uh, those aromatic components, the phenols and the esters, I would have expected to be different. So this was COVID protocol. So we did 10 separate triangle tests. And under that protocol, I would have be expected to get it right seven times in order for the data to be significant, uh, but I actually only got it right five times, which was 50%, but still not significant. So I wasn't able to tell these beers apart. And honestly, I'm surprised I got it right five times. I mean, I, I mean, they, they, those were total guesses. Um, I, I mean, I remember being like, I remember being frustrated by this one, uh, because I was like, I, I should see a difference here. I was just so convinced and that's my bias playing in, right? I was so convinced that I should see a difference in these beers, but I just didn't. If there's anything good that has come from the COVID protocol uh, experiment stuff and the way we're doing this, it's that even with our massive amount of bias, the fact that not only did you have a preconceived notion of how you know the pitch rate uh, differences was going to impact this vice beer, even with being the brewer of the beers, all of that, you still could not reliably distinguish the underpitched one from the overpitched one. To me, that speaks volumes about just how big that impact might be. Now, yes, people are you. You mentioned it earlier. People are going to contend. 100 billion cells was not a huge underpitch. You're right. And 300 billion cells may not be a huge overpitch, but that is a 200 billion cell difference. And yet both of these beers tasted identical to you. I mean, that, that to me is just so fascinating. You can take these results however you want to. To me, it's fascinating. And it, and it, it kind of confirms if you are making you know good wort and you are pitching an adequate amount of yeast, which I love the fact that Imperial yeast does 200 billion cells per pouch because that is an adequate amount of yeast for most pouches or for most uh, for most beers that you make. You don't have to worry about building up a big starter. You don't. Maybe not. At least I'm not saying people should stop doing that. But but you know, hey, you're in a rush. You got a fresh pouch of yeast. You made a 1050 OG wort. Toss it in there. It's probably going to do fine. 
Yeah, yeah, and I mean, I, w- I would say the the two things that are really easy to ex- that that are low hanging fruit to explain this experiment is is that yeah, like you said, a hundred billion cells is enough, right? And this isn't an experiment trying to decide which level of uh, pitching and under pitching is the right amount to improve which flavor, right? This yeah. is just an under pitch versus over pitch experiment, and a three to one uh, yeast ratio is a big jump. Uh, you know, that's a, that's a big over pitch versus under pitch. Uh, you know, the other thing. Too, and this is props to Imperial, um, it is that maybe, you know, maybe there was more than 200 billion cells in the pouch itself, right? So maybe uh, whenever I was splitting it or, or you know, uh, um, dividing it up, there was 125 or 150,000 cells. But still, it should be still be a three to one, uh, shell, uh, you know, difference. So that would be a huge over pitch uh, versus a slight under pitch, which I think is still interesting data. So even with those two sort of caveats, um, which I think, again, are low hanging fruit to explain uh, the, the result, even with those two caveats, I would still think that I would see some fermentation character um, yeah. in this, but I but I just didn't, and that's that's surprising. Yeah, it's fascinating, and uh, to to kind of I, I so I um I asked Imperial at one point, hey, listen, are, are are you sure there's not more than 200 billion cells per pouch? And we'll just put it this way, I did not get a clear response, <laughs> so I don't know. <laughs> I, I you, there's no way that they're counting 100, you know, to exactly 200 billion cells per pouch. But I've often wondered the same thing because I, I haven't made a starter in well over two years at this point and I'm just pitching straight you know pouches of imperial yeast and and I've done it with like five month old pouches of yeast and they take off within 24 hours and ferment beautifully so I don't know what their magic is what their mojo is but I love it and that could explain help to explain at the very least why your results were what they were it's just that, that you had you maybe there was more yeast in there to start anyways I don't know I do believe that if we were to go even more extreme, and I think we should do this as a repeat experiment, if you were to go with maybe 50 billion cells in one batch and 400 billion cells in the other batch, I do think at some point you're going to start to see or taste or perceive a difference in those beers. And perhaps that's what it is, is that you have to do a significant underpitch in order to get that, uh, that stronger fermentation, fermentation character out of it. Yeah, exactly. I mean, this one's easy to follow up with the science, right? There's been a, bu- a bunch of papers that have looked at yeast pitch rate. I mean, scientific articles and a bunch of, you know, uh, homebrew magazines. There's stuff all over the internet that supports, you know, this sort of, uh, this this phenomenon that under-pitching yeast results in, uh, you know, esters. I mean, it's it's not something that that um, that's necessarily murky or foggy, right? So the results of my experiment here saying that I wasn't able to tell the difference doesn't mean that necessarily I was wrong. Or the you know that the beers did, and I just wasn't good enough. Um, it, it 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 just means that you know, like you said, Marshall, maybe we need to expand it a little bit more. Maybe you know you can be safe uh, with a three to one under pitch versus over pitch, um, and make a consistent beer that doesn't taste all that different. Yeah. Uh, you know, so I think there's also some good aspects of this as well. It's just that hey, um, you know, maybe this particular strain, the Weinsteffen strain, isn't as sensitive uh, to those. Uh, uh, the underpitch overpitch character. And one of the reasons I say that too is because remember the Weinsteffen strain is very heavily phenolic. Um, and at least that's how it comes across to me. It's very heavily clove with more of a subtle banana character. And again, that ester is what really should change with pitch rate. Uh, so maybe it's limited just to this specific strain too. Who knows? Um, but you know, if you're looking for a good solid uh, Weiss beer strain, I mean, that Weinsteffen is, is, you know, hundreds of year old, years old and still used for a reason <laughs> yeah yeah that's the it's the it's the go-to man i mean it's, it's a great strain for this style now i'm not really sure i can say that these results have influenced my perspective when it comes to pitch rate and vice beers um i actually have a vice beer brew day planned and i i'll just be pitching a single pouch of stefan <laughs> into it uh it's geo one not geo three by the way uh and uh, i'm just not going to be worrying about it at that point it'll be fresh yeast pitch a, pitch a pouch and, and and let it rip so well we've got some reader comments to get to the first one comes from burned uh who says i did some research on the banana thing as well recently and read that a higher mash temp and fermentation temperature of 21 to 23 C, which I believe is about 70 degrees Fahrenheit ish, uh, would be more appropriate to get the banana esters. Hmm. I, I don't really know uh, much about the higher mash temperature, right? And, and how that would, 
how that would increase ester production because, oh, you know what? It might Im- increase the amount of free amino nitrogen that's in solution. If that were the case, then that would make sense. If you're increasing the amount of amino acids that are available for the yeast to take up that they can turn into higher alcohols and subsequently esters, that would make sense. So maybe that's actually a, an aspect of it. That's something that literally just popped into my mind. <laughs> so so if that's not right or if that's the wrong science, I apologize. Send me an email about it. Yeah, I, I can't speak to this because I would never view mash temp as being something that would would contribute to fermentation character, though it makes some element of sense because we know that, you know, different enzymes are doing different things based on mash temp. So perhaps the breakdown of those longer chain sugars at a higher mat that, you know, that result in a, in a wort uh, with a higher mash temp, maybe, maybe that uh, does contribute to some sort of fermentation character. I think it's an interesting, uh, interesting thing to experiment with. So Next comment comes from Sergio Tibaldi, who says, in my experience with WB06 dry yeast, neither temperature nor underpitching have an impact. However, adding at least 10 grams per liter of table sugar did produce banana esters. A high fermentation temperature around 72 to 75 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 22 to 24 C, sometimes produces esters, but not in a predictable or pleasant way. Fascinating comment. Yeah, that's really fascinating. I don't know what about sucrose would... um would uh uh mean that would 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 result in esters it's got to be something with the way that sucrose is broken down um in in beer because sucrose is different than maltose and glucose and fructose and some of the other maltotriose and and all the other beers that are normally present um in wort uh and and so yeah it it would it, it may be something that specifically due to that sugar uh although i would be suspicious of that a little bit yep. but that's just my own my own uh you know bias and anecdote playing in there but the high temperatures not resulting in predictable esters that's something i think is definitely been my experience and again i think it makes a lot of sense if you're thinking about um you know esters are coming from yeast uh, you know oh, growing rapidly um you know and so higher temperatures making yeast grow rapidly and be more metabolically ap- a- a- active there's going to be different rates at which they're metabolically active and depending on the amount of yeast that's in there you may have uh uh, inconsistent results. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Uh, next comment comes from AJ who says, I did a similar vice beer experiment, two batches, same recipe, different pitch rates. In one batch, I pitched a large starter propped up from bottle dregs of a commercial vice beer. In the other batch, I pitched the dregs of a single bottle, no starter at all. So the comparison was a normal to large, healthy pitch versus an extreme under pitch. The starter batch fermented fast and clean. The bottle dregs batch was slower and had a lot of fermentation character, including some super interesting juicy fruit gum flavors. I've heard that the yeast contribution to flavor and aroma tends to come mostly during the growth phase. That theory makes sense to me because large pitches uh, could ferment fast without time uh, for the yeast to grow, resulting in clean beers, while significant under pitches should allow the yeast more time to grow before the sugars are consumed, resulting in more yeast character. Yep. Boom. I mean, that last paragraph is exactly what we've been talking about yep. now. The, yeah. So, so that's awesome. Uh, the, the juicy fruit gum character, I'm wondering what yeast, uh, since that was from the bottle dregs ones, um, Nottingham is a common one or champagne yeast is another common one that people will put in bottle in bottles for bottle conditioning, right? They won't necessarily use the vine Stefan strain for bottle conditioning. They might use a different strain to increase that carbonation character or a one that's more consistently a carbon producer and some of those champagne yeast are typically they're typically clean and that's why they would use them in bottles but i could see on a repitch um if you're trying to harvest that and grow and just ferment with that strain i have heard about those champagne yeast throwing off those sort of juicy fruity white wine type flavors um i i've done one bottle dregs thing because i was i was on the hunt for wherever uh, wlp 090 was sourced from and i think i wrote an article about this on on the website but uh i i was told that port brewing out of san diego is where the 090 strain was was uh sourced from you know it was like a oh people were kind of speculating as to where it came from and so uh they bottle condition and so i thought yes i've, I've got a uh bomber of mondo their ipa really good ipa and uh you know drank the beer and then i collected the bottle dregs and i built up a starter from it and i pitched it into an ipa and uh come to find out they bottle condition with the champagne yeast and it was awful (laughs) so (laughs) that was my experience with that i did not get juicy fruit from it it just tasted bad uh so (laughs) (laughs) final comment comes from tom goodwin and i and i like this one because i i want to respond to it 
He says, why did you cold crash a Hefeweizen? <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's a good question. Uh, Cause it's my normal brewing process. Hell honestly. Yeah. <laughs> no. Uh, yeah. Uh, you know, it's not the only thing that, you know, the yeast itself can still fall out of solution in a Hefeweizen. Um, you know, there's a lot of things that can still happen there uh, um, for cold crashing. Uh, but, you know, the main thing is you got to get the beer cold somehow. Exactly. Um, Thank so, you. So, so it's going to be part of it. <laughs> that's the, that's the, the, this misconception that cold crashing is just to clarify beer. Listen, are you going to drink your beer warm? It's going to get cold at some point. I want to keg clean beer that doesn't have hops floating around in it or doesn't, isn't overly yeasty. Um, uh, you know, the haze in a Hefeweizen is in part because of the yeast. It's in part because of the wheat, uh, pro, you know, proteins uh, suspended in solution, all of that stuff. I, I, I cold crash everything because I don't want to transfer that stuff to my keg. And, it, and if you transfer it to your keg and you put it in the fridge, you're cold crashing it. And the first four or five pints are going to be full of gunk that you could have left in the fermentation vessel. So that's why we cold crash Hefeweizen. All right. That's all we've got on the impact yeast pitch rate has on Vice Beer. Any last words before we wrap things up, Cade? No, this one was an interesting one. I'd love, like you said, Marshall, to see the next iteration, which is a much larger pitch rate, maybe like 50 billion cells versus, you know, 400. Yeah. uh, And see if this actually makes a difference. But yeah, it was a fun experiment. Yeah, I look forward to seeing uh, more pitch rate experiments when it comes to more characterful beers as well. Well, don't forget to check out the Brew Lab where Cade takes you into the lab with real brewing experts to discuss the fascinating work they've done on brewing and beer. And as always, you can read more about the experiment we discussed by clicking the link to the article on brewlosophy.com in the description of this episode. The Brewlosophy podcast is made possible by the generous support of our sponsors as well as all of our rad listeners. We seriously could not do this without you. Cheers to everyone who has subscribed and left a review of our show. It makes a huge difference. If you haven't yet, please consider doing so. Head over to brewlosophy.com slash support to view a list of ways you can easily help us to continue producing this podcast. If you want a reward for your support, visit patreon.com slash brewlosophy. Thanks again for listening. We'll be back next week with another episode of the Brewlosophy podcast. Until then, think beer. Start off the morning with some hot tea, lemon and honey, cause it suits my bro. Put some herb in the bowl, yeah, it's homegrown. Ain't gotta go through the middle man. No.